Okay, so I think we can get uh, started here, even though some people are coming in. So great to see so many of you guys here. Um, my name is Håkan Silvernagel. I'm going to be talking about why you should consider WebAssembly in your next front-end project. And um, first of all, I just want to give you some background information about me before we get the talk started. So uh, who am I? I have a background in software development for process automation and robotics. I've been working on the .NET platform since it was released in the early 2000s. And I've been working as a consultant since 2010. So I've had lots of different types of roles and I'm also interested in IoT in, and in artificial intelligence. But the topic for this talk is uh, WebAssembly. So basically what we're going to do today is we will first get an introduction into what WebAssembly is, how you can compile things down to WebAssembly, and also how you as a regular web developer actually can use uh, WebAssembly through an NPM uh, package. So we're going to go through how can we compile things to WebAssembly and then package it as an NPM package and upload it to NPM and then use it in a website. Then we're going to go through some real, more real-life examples of WebAssembly. And we're also going to look into the crystal ball and see what will happen to WebAssembly in uh, probably this year and next year. And we will also look at some uh, alternative uh, implementation that is also using WebAssembly. But the first question here, what is WebAssembly? And actually, I would just like to ask the audience, how many of you have used uh, WebAssembly? Uh, there are some uh, some hands, so that's a good good thing here because then you're uh, in the, the right session here. So, uh, WebAssembly was actually started. Uh, there was a group formed in 2015 by all the major web browsers, and then in uh, the late 2017 they released a WebAssembly uh, uh, release. And then in February last year, this was uh, a public draft was published as a V3C uh, standard. And this is one of the good things with WebAssembly is that since it is a standard, all of the major browsers are uh, supporting it. And it's also able to use it on all the mobile browsers. And we will see that in a while what, why that is um, uh, an advantage. But if we take a high level picture here of the web, if we see the web sort of uh, platform or as a virtual machine, we can see that there are two different parts. One is uh, controlled by JavaScript. So as we all know, JavaScript is more of a high level language. It's very flexible and expressive. It's dynamically typed and so on. You don't need to do any compilation and it has this huge ecosystem. Then on the other hand, we have WebAssembly, which is a low level assembly like language. And it is, has a com uh, compact binary format and it uh, will run with near native performance. And then, uh, you know, what you can do, either you can write WebAssembly by hand, and we will, I will show you what that looks like, but uh, I think we'll qu quite quickly get the grasp that that's not the really the way that we want to use, work with WebAssembly. So what do you want to do is you want to use one of the languages that you're comfortable with, like C or C++ or Rust, and then you can compile that code down to WebAssembly. So uh, WebAssembly is uh, a abbreviated WASM. So the reason why we could get WebAssembly out quite fast was that there had been a lot of previous work done uh, through um, a project called ASM.js. So that was sort of a blueprint for what would become WebAssembly. So it's an in intermediate language. So uh, in a similar way that Java compiles down to bytecode and C Sharp to MSIL. And it has four different types. Uh, you have 32-bit integers and 64-bit integers, and 32-bit float, and 64-bit float. And then we have some, uh, some 70 instructions uh, that we can use when we work with WebAssembly. Um, so I think uh, one way to, uh, I think the best way here is just to start with a hello, hello world example, hello wasp. So you know, usually when we run our hello world examples, we will, uh, put in a string, uh, hello world, and we will get that output. But the thing is, as you saw on the previous slide, uh, WebAssembly doesn't support string. So string is not the type in WebAssembly. So, uh, so that is a bit of a problem. So instead of uh, using a string, we will just use uh, either addition or subtraction. Subtraction is usually what is used for this hello world example. 
So we will use uh, an addition example here. So here we have something called add.wat, which stands for WebAssembly text format. So there are two formats here for the WebAssembly. One is the text textual format representation, and the other one is the binary format representation. So what we can do is we can define a, a module, and in that module we have a function that we call add to. And to that function we have two input uh, parameters with 32-bit uh, integer. And then we wa want to have our result back also as an integer 32. So uh, WebAssembly is a stack-based language, so we can uh, pull and push from the stack. And then we can perform one of these uh, 70 functions that I mentioned. So here we have a function called I integer 32 adds, so we can add the things that are on the stack. And then we can uh, export, by using the keyword export, we, uh, uh, we can name this function so that an external program can call this function by just using the add to uh, description. And then we also define what is the actual function that will be called if we call add to. So that's this function that we have right here. So if we want to have a look at what this looks like, then we can use a tool called WebAssembly to Wasp. So um, we can uh, uh, get it down to binary format, which, we, which is this add.wasm, or we can also have a textual uh, or a view of this binary format. So that's what you can see up here. So it's very much looking uh, like an assembly-like language. So as you can understand, I mean, this is not really what we would like to work with. So. Um, but uh, how, how do we use the WebAssembly now that we have our WebAssembly in a binary format? Well, we can just define a, an HTML page, and in our HTML page we do a fetch, fetch of our binary WebAssembly, and then uh, uh, we read in the result into an array buffer, and then uh, since this is a standard, we can just call WebAssembly.instantiate on the thing that we, uh, we read in. And then we can uh, call results.instant and then export and then this function. So remember we call this function add to and we can assign that to uh, a parameter that we also call, that, call add to. And then we can just use a regular alert function in JavaScript so we can do alert and then add to and then insert the numbers that we want to have added. Yeah, so uh, lo and behold, this is what happens if we run this in the browser. So we have done our first WebAssembly edition here. Another tool which uh, it can be interesting to know about is the Wasp Code Explorer. So what we can do with this is if we have a binary WebAssembly file, we can load that into the WebAssembly Code Explorer, and then we will get the texture representation, the WAT, uh, representation of that file. So that's what I've done here. I just took the binary file that we had and then I loaded it up into the code explorer and just to double check that we actually get uh, back what we had when we started. So that looks uh, quite okay. But that, it, this can be useful if you run into a web assembly and you want to know a little bit about how this was constructed, then you can use this Wasp code explorer to find out how it was actually implemented. But as, as I said, this is not really how, would we, how we would like to use WebAssembly. Instead, we would like to use a high-level language that we can compile down to WebAssembly. And uh, one of these uh, high-level languages is called Rust. So uh, what is uh, Rust? So Rust is a language developed by Mozilla. It's a system programming language, and it has a syntax similar to C and C++, and it's strongly typed and it compiles down to native code. And one of the things with Rust, which is uh, special, it has a memory safe guarantee. So the language itself was designed from bottom up not to uh, have any uh, memory leaks. So when we use uh, Rust, there are a couple of tools that we need to know about. So in the Rust, we have a tool chain consisting of something called RustUp, so the Rust app is an in, in installer for Rust, and then we have Cargo, which is a package manager. So in the same way as we have uh, NPM in JavaScript, we have uh, the Cargo. And uh, in the Rust world, we call these packages for crates. 
And there's also a site called crates.io where people can load up their different crates so that uh, some other developers can use it. And then we have Rust C, which is the Rust compiler. So what we can do here is we can define a function, a main function, and in the main function, we use a print line function and we print the hello world. And then we can do Rust compile on our main.rust file. And then we can, so if we do that on a Windows machine, we get an exe file. And then if we run that, we get hello world back. But we can also use cargo to get sort of a stub for a project. So if we run the cargo new hello world, cargo will create an application called hello world or a project uh, for the hello world. So we get the source folder and we get the main Rust file and we also get the cargo.toml file. So in the main Rust file, uh, we can uh, uh, implement the main function which is again uh, printing out this hello world. And then the cargo toml file, that's a package definition. So in the package definition, there are some minimum uh, requirements that you have, need to have the name of this package and what version and also the authors of the package. And then we also have a section for dependencies so we can depend on uh, other packages too. So we'll see that in a short while how, how that works out. So if we run the cargo run, it will compile our Hello World application and then it will also run it and then it will uh, output Hello World. So we have uh, some different types here in Rust. So we have primitive, primitive types, Boolean, integer and float and so on. And we also have some primitive constructs like uh, tuples and arrays and pointers and so on. But now the question is here, how can we use Rust? If we want to use Rust in order to compile down to WebAssembly, and then we want to package that WebAssembly as an NPM package, and then publish it up to NPM. So that's, uh, that's what I'm gonna show you right now, how we can go about to do this. So first thing that we need to do, we need to install this tool chain, the Rust app cargo and the Rust compiler. And then we need to add a new uh, compiler target to WebAssembly, which is called Wasp32 unknown unknown. And then after that, we install a separate uh, a tool called Wasp Bindgen. So the Wasp Bindgen, what that does, it generates bindings to and from JavaScript uh, for Rust and Wasm so that we can call this uh, this method from our JavaScript application code. So this is an example of how that looks like. So this is again this package definition. So we have the name, version and the authors and so on. And then uh, we define what kind of type is this crate. So this crate is a type of, it's called the C dynamic library. And then we define the dependencies. So th in uh, this uh, uh, case, we want to depend on this wasp bindgen in order to get uh, the uh, code necessary for us in order to be able to call it from our JavaScript file. So this is our sort of main uh, Rust file, the lib.rs file. And in here, we define that we want to use an external crate. So we want to use this wasp bindgen and then we can annotate some functions using this wasp binding. So we can define that we want to use an external function uh, from JavaScript. So we want to use the alert function from the JavaScript world inside of our, uh, uh, of our WebAssembly and Rust code. And then we can also define what is the name of this function in uh, Rust that we will be able to uh, uh, execute. So we call that uh, that, that's done with the keyword pub. So we define that greet, it will have a, a string input name, and then we call this uh, external function alert, and we just do some format on that thing, and then we can write out uh, or return the hello, hello and the name parameter. So in order to, uh, if we compile this and then we do run the wasp pack in it, then we will get the package folder, and in this package folder, we have everything that we need in order to be able to publish it up to NPM. So we, we can just uh, uh, 
going to the director for the package, and then we just do, as we usually do, we do an NPM and publish package, and then we have it up on NPM and anyone can use it. So I just called my NPM package for Hello Wasp Silver, which was the code that we was just looking at, at and now we'll just have a look at what is, uh, what was generated into this package folder. So first of all, we have a TypeScript file, and in this TypeScript file, we have sort of the type definitions for our code. And basically what that is, is that's, that is what is the name and what is the parameters for the functions that we want to be able to call from our JavaScript uh, function. And then the second thing we have is a JavaScript file. And this JavaScript is actually the glue between our application code in JavaScript and our uh, WASM file. So for example, you can see here if we, uh, if we call our function greet, then there is a function called past string to wasm, and then with uh, the argument that we call, called in, for example. And then we have our package definition of package.json, and in that we just define, we have a list of the files that this package consists of, which is the, uh, the WebAssembly file, and this types, uh, definition file, the TypeScript file, and also our JavaScript glue file, and uh, yeah, also the TypeScript file again. So if we want to use this file, uh, then we can make a simple webpack config file, and where we just uh, define what is the entry to our application uh, and the index uh, JavaScript file, and then we have our package file, and in this, this package file, we just make a dependency to our npm package, which was this uh, hello wasp silver package. And uh, then we can just write an index HTML file where we reference um, a JavaScript file, index.js. And in that, we can import this hello wasp silver package. And then we can call this asynchronously by calling uh, js and then the function that we were calling greet and the input parameters. So if we run this web application, then we will have hello and then the input that we wanted to have. So, the, uh, so this was some example of both how we can do, well, how does WebAssembly look you know, right from the start and how can we write it almost by hand? And also we've also looked at how can we use a higher level language like Rust and then how can we, how can we compile or web, um, how can we compile that down to WebAssembly and then packages into an NPM package so that anyone can, uh, can use it. But this has been quite a simple example, so what if we want to have some more interactivity? So we will have a look at an implementation of the game of life. Um, so the game of life is basically that you have a board with uh, lots of different cells and then there are some rules to this game. So if you have a live cell with fewer than two live neighbors, it will die because then it will be underpopulated. Or if you have a live cell with two or three live neighbors, then it will live on to the next generation. So it's a simulation which goes on and on and on. And if you have a live cell with more than three live neighbors, it will die because then it will be overpopulated. And any dead cell with exactly three live neighbors becomes a live cell because then it will be uh, by reproduction. And this is an example if, uh, from a book which is available online, which is called uh, uh, The Rust uh, Game of Life. So here we can see the cell in the simulation, and we also we have a button here, a pause button, so that we can go in and interact with our simulation. So now we pr press pause, and then we add some extra cell in our simulation, like this, and then we run our simulation again. So we're gonna have a look at how can we achieve this in uh, WebAssembly and uh, Rust. So uh, again, here we have the TOML file, which is this package definition. Uh, again, we define this as a C dynamic library, and uh, then we have a dependency again on the WASP bind gen. And then this is our main uh, Rust file. So we define our universe, which is this simulation board with the different cells. And, uh, yeah. and at the end of the function, whatever is mentioned last in the function is actually what gets 
returns. So in this function, the universe with some set with the height and the number of cells, that's what w is what will be returned from this function when it is called. And then we also define some uh, public getter and setter functions so that we can set the width and height of this uh, board and set the number of cells. And we also define uh, um, an event handler here, toggle cell, so that we can, uh, yeah, so that we can toggle the cell when we uh, push or, or mark it. Then we also have this TypeScript file. And here we can see the different types of functions that we can call from our application code. So we can call new, that will return a uni universe. We can call render, which will return a string, and width and height and so on will return numbers. And we have this toggle cell, which has to return void, but it has, uh, it has a cell with an X and a Y coordinate, so that we know which cell it was that we uh, wanted to uh, toggle. And then we also have this glue file, this JavaScript file. So this glue file, again, that, that's sort of the glue between our application JavaScript file and our web assembly. So in this glue file, we define this setters that I was talking about, the width and the height. And we also have this toggle cell function. So for example, you can see here in the toggle cell function, then we return wasp.universe.toggle cell, and then with the arguments that we were uh, defining. Then we can have uh, an HTML page, and in this we just use a bootstrap JavaScript file. And in the bootstrap JavaScript file, we, um, we load an index file, so, uh, which is also a JavaScript file. And in this index file, we sort of set up our game. So we import the universe from this Wasp game of life, and then we define an event listener and I guess the most interesting thing here is that we can call a function on this universe. We can call universe toggle cell with a row and the, and the column. So that's an example of how we can do something which is a little bit more sophisticated. The question is here, uh, how do people actually use WebAssembly out in the real world? So uh, as of now, uh, there are two main use cases for WebAssembly. So one use case is if you have something which needs to be performant, like for example, if you have some image manipulation or maybe you're working with sound or video and you want to change from one codec to another, that could be a good use case for WebAssembly since that's performant. Another type of use case is if you already have uh, an application, a desktop application written in C or C++ and you want that available on the web, then you can compile your application from, uh, from the C code that you already have to WebAssembly, and then you can just load it in a web page. So we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna have a quick look at two examples of uh, how this uh, has been done. So uh, the first example here is from a digital signal processing uh, library. So yeah, there were some people, so this is up on GitHub, so some people that had a digital signal processing library for processing both of videos and of images to have different types of filters. And uh, um, then what they did was that they used WebAssembly so that they could publish, publish this up on the web. So here we can see this is a video feed, and then we can just use different filters here to filter things in uh, real time on the web. And this goes both for, uh, both for video and for images. Another example is AutoCAD. So AutoCAD is a, a big company which, has, uh, which is active in the drawing industry. So they have uh, lots of different draw types of drawings from a long time ago, and what they wanted to do, they wanted to somehow make this available out on the web. So they started out in 2010, and the, the technology that was hot at that time was Flash. So they made a Flash app so that they could show some of their drawings in this Flash app. Then if we uh, fast forward a couple of years, then we get into the HTML5 land. So then by using HTML5 and JavaScript, you could also uh, expose this functionality on the web. 
and then they were actually quite early on uh, they were using a compiler called mscripten so mscripten is used to compile c code c and c++ codes to webassembly so uh, since their product is based on c++ they could use that in order to expose their drawings out on the web and then in april they were uh, so their format is called dwg so they were using WebAssembly in order to make a viewer for all their different DWG drawings. And that's quite powerful because, you know, they have been around since a long, long time ago and there are lots of customers which has old drawings and maybe it's too time consuming to send it or fax it or something so they could just expose it up on the web. And now in March last year, they uh, released the AutoCAD web app. And, uh, uh, I'm going to show you what the uh, uh, architecture is for this web app. So basically, you have three different levels. So uh, the first level is the uh, interaction between the core library, which is C++ code, and then they compile it down to WebAssembly, and then they have JavaScript functions that call this WebAssembly, and then you can just then you can just use any type of UI component library. So if you want to use React or Angular or Vue or write your own JavaScript, that's just, uh, that's just fine. So uh, the benefit of this setup is that then the people that were uh, working with the core library, they can still work on that thing and they don't need to be bothered about new uh, JavaScript frameworks and so on. And conversely, the people that are strong in the JavaScript world, they don't need to bother about C++. So I think uh, we get a really great separate of concerns by using this type of architecture. So the question is here, what are some future plans here for WebAssembly? So, so I don't know if you noticed here, but every time I showed you an example, I was talking about that we have a glue file, a glue JavaScript file, which is sort of the glue between our application JavaScript and, uh, and the WebAssembly. So they want to get rid of that so that we can actually call directly from and to the WebAssembly up to the Doom and maybe use web APIs and other stuff. Uh, another thing that they would like to be able to do is now when we load a WebAssembly, we need to do that asynchronously, but instead we, they want to be able to directly import the uh, WebAssembly into JavaScript. And also what they want to do also is have more support for languages. Like, uh, like I said in the start here, um, it's this, uh, the memory managed languages are not uh, supported. So, um, uh, so for example, Java and C Sharp, they wanted to have more support for that. So there's a strong, some strong development done in that area. I'm also go, going to be talking a little bit about a new framework which can be interesting to, to know about using Wasp. So this framework is called uh, Blazor. So what Blazor enables you to do is to do full stack web development using C Sharp and WebAssembly. So that means that you can, as a C Sharp developer, you can write your whole web application just using C Sharp. So this started out, I should also say that this is an experimental uh, framework, so it's not something that you should use in production. But basically, it uh, runs on WebAssembly, it has a native performance, and also it runs, I haven't said this, but WebAssembly runs in the same security as regular JavaScript. So there are a lot of things that you can't really do, you, I mean, you can't, uh, it, it runs under the same conditions as, as JavaScript. And this has its origin in a talk from the Norwegian Developer Conference in 2017. So there was a guy called Steve Sanderson. He uh, had a presentation about new web standards. And then he, w he was just mentioning, so, uh, so what if you could actually run C Sharp in the browser? And then, uh, and then that was what he did. And then you could see in the audience was a huge gasp because no one really believed what they, what they saw. So what he did in order to, uh, uh, to do that was that he uh, found there was someone who had written um, the .NET framework for C, and by using that framework or parts of the .NET framework, he could compile it down to WebAssembly, and then he could use 
uh, use this WebAssembly in the browser and call some C sharp functions. And the ASP.NET team thought that, oh, this is really interesting because one of the hurdles is that, you know, for people who are used to do desktop development, maybe it's a it's a strong hurdle to get into the JavaScript world with React and NPM and all this uh, different stuff. So what if you can just use C Sharp in your whole ap application? So they started a new framework called Blazor. So the idea here with Blazor is that you have your C Sharp file and you compile this to .NET assemblies. And then in the browser, you run your application as a DLL and then you have your different .NET DLLs, and then you have the web, so in the WebAssembly, the Mono framework is running in the WebAssembly, and since the Mono is a part of this, is an implementation of the .NET framework, any uh, DLL can run inside that. So this is a simple example of how this can look like. So this is a simple page counter. So in this page counter, we define a function where we can increment the current count of the page. And then we can just, we can use this just as a component. So we can import the counter and then we just counter and then we set an increment amount. So now when we click this, click me button, it will increment in amounts of 10. And then the interesting thing here is, as you see, if we look in the browser, then we have some things which we are not so used to see. We have the Microsoft ASP.NET Core DLLs and a lot of other DLLs that we're not uh, regularly seeing in, in the browser. So I think this can be an interesting thing to look at. So maybe there will be similar developments for, for Java and other languages too. So um, yeah. But now a question that you can ask yourself, Man, but uh, haven't we seen all of this before? Isn't this part of you know, the new, old, new, old, new, old thing? Well, we have. So, uh, <laughs> so maybe for some of you uh, might remember the ActiveX components that had a lot of promise, but failed, and then we had Flash, and we also had Silverlight. But the main difference between these previous attempts is that now this, the, so all of these, they were proprietary formats. But what, what we have now is we have a web standard that all the major browsers are implementing, and it's also implemented for the mobile browsers. So I think that is, uh, that's one of the crucial things uh, needed for this to be a success. And then I also have some uh, references here for people who would like to know more. So there are some ex excellent tutorials on WebAssembly so that you can start it from, from scratch. And then also some pointers to, to Blazor if you're interested in, in that. So that was basically all that I wanted to present. So I want to thank you so much for your time. And then uh, maybe do we have do we have some we have some time here for questions? Do we have some questions? Yes. Mm. Uh, so the question was if I had any idea about the state of this feature that to render to Doom. How uh, if that is no no I don't have that uh, now I just know that they are working on it so we so uh, the best bet is just to keep an eye on what what is going on. And I think there was another, was there another question about a little bit further back in the row here yes. Uh, so the question was here if there was any GUI toolkit for uh, for doing this. Yeah, that's um, one of the things. Uh, so I chose uh, Rust here in my examples because that's the most mature uh, tool uh, tool that is available for WebAssembly. Like if you're going to use MScript, then that's a lot more hassle to get these things up and working. So there are no really m there are no really uh, more tools than what I actually showed you right now. But I think that we can expect as time goes on and as these things are 
progressing, we will receive more and more tool support for WebAssembly. Then we have a question here. Uh, actually, I'm a little, I'm a little bit uh, unsure. If, so, so the question here is, what if we, for example, in the Rust program, if we do something which is not allowed in the browser, like if we do some multi-threading or something, what will happen then? And I'm not sure if you will uh, have some sort of exception. Probably you will have from the compiler, I think. And I will also stay, be, uh, stay around for after this presentation. So if you have any questions, you can just uh, uh, come up and talk to me. So thank you very much for this uh, time.